When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you, throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Thank you, Josh. Amen. That's the word of the Lord. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, We are grateful that you give us reminders of your grace, reminders of your covenant, and reminders of your goodness to us, Um, that even as we read the horrible, embarrassing story last week that, that filled Abram, Sarai, and Hagar with shame, God, you speak grace to him, and you uphold your covenant to him. And so, Lord, I I pray that this morning, as as we look to your word, that we would not only understand what circumcision is and why it was given, but that it would point us to the fulfillment of circumcision, which we know is Christ. And so, Lord, I pray that this morning you would fix our eyes upon Jesus um, and help us just see the beauty of your love and your grace and your mercy for us, that while we were still sinners, you, you gave Christ to die for us. It's in his name that we can gather this morning, his name that we can sing, and his name that we can pray to you. Amen. Amen. Well, I I remember when I was maybe about 12 or 13 or 14 years old, um, I, you know, like many of you, attended church, and this was the passage for that Sunday. Um, Now, being an innocent, sheltered kid who grew up in a Christian home, um, I had no idea what circumcision was, and about halfway through the sermon, I was afraid to ask. Um, Now, obviously, having wrestled with this a lot over the last, really this week, but but weeks and and I think even years before that, um, I wish I did in the moment just lean over and go, Mom, Dad, like, what is that? What is circumcision? What does that mean? Because I I think if we don't understand what circumcision is, we miss the whole point of the passage. Um, Now, I I know we have people of all ages here um, with all different um, kind of backgrounds and everything, so um, I I pray and hope that I'm not going to handle this subject matter crudely, um, but but I don't want to skip over certain important specific aspects of this covenant um, because God could have used anything, anything as a sign of the covenant. I mean, Noah got a rainbow, right? I'm sure Abram like, probably looks back and he's like, man, he got it really easy, right? God could have used anything, but he specifically chose circumcision for this covenant and for this man and, and this family. And so my, my hope and prayer today is that we would understand why God did that and then kind of process through how does this culminate in Christ, and what does it mean for us today? All right, 
So let, let's, let's look at the first eight verses where I think we see first and foremost the, the, the headline of that first paragraph is God's grace, okay? God's grace. My three points today, you're going to love it. It's alliteration. Um, it's awesome. So God's grace, verses one through eight. Now, if you read, it says, Abram was 99 years old. Now, look right back up to the end of chapter 16. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael. So, about 13 years took place between these two stories. 13 years after this whole saga with Hagar happens, and and God shows up and says, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. Now, after seeing In Genesis 15, God's covenant is rooted in his character. Then verse 16, we know what happens with Abram and Hagar. And here in verse 17, God is demanding blamelessness from a man who just had one of the most embarrassing, guilt-ridden stories and, and sins and pitfalls we found definitely it's this far into the Bible, maybe even in the whole Bible. He's, but God demands blamelessness from Abram, who isn't blameless. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm going, well, why is he doing that? Well, it's just as Robert said earlier, it's because God is blameless. He is God Almighty. He's the creator of everything. And so when God tells Abram, why? Why must you be blameless? Well, look at the purpose clause, verse 2, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. So basically what God is saying is this. He's saying, you need to be holy because I'm holy. And for us to commune together, for us to have a relationship together, for me to keep my promise to you, we got to be on the same page. We have to be on the same page. If you are, I will uphold my covenant and I will multiply you greatly. And you're like, okay, sounds good. But what's the catch? Abram's not blameless. As I said last week, no amount of good deeds can make a tarnished record perfect again. I mean, you could look at his time in Egypt, you could look at his story with Hagar, you can see his blame all over the pages of his story so far. And so, what does Abram do when God says, walk before me, the God Almighty, and be blameless? Verse 3, he falls on his face. He falls on his face he knows he's full of fault. He knows he'll never be blameless. I mean, and, and remember, this is Abram, who despite his faults, probably is holier than any of us here today. He falls on his face, aware of his sin, in light of the holiness of God. I mean, that should humble us. It definitely humbled me. Because I feel like we we live in a time, we live in a culture, and I would even critique Christians. I think it's common for a lot of us to promise good fortune or promise eternal joy if you're mostly good. Mostly good. As long as you're better than the rest, I I don't know, you know, everyone understands, okay, perfection's impossible, so we just shoot for good enough. I'm better than I was, or I'm better than this person, or that person, or, well, I'm trying my best. It's the heart that counts. And we ignore passages like what Pastor Robert just said, that the heart's deceitful above all things. We set that aside, and we say, but, but I'm trying my best. I think I'm good enough, which still isn't attainable, but it's beside the point. But we have not been authorized by God to determine what is good enough apart from His character. We have to understand that. Because to change God's standards would then necessarily change his character or to make him cease being God, which would mean he's no longer perfectly holy. He would no longer be God Almighty, verse 1. Now, this is really important to understand, right? Because we, we, we can't gloss over the holiness of God. We can't just go, okay, I'm the Lord Almighty. Walk before me blameless. Okay, da-da-da-da-da. Let's get to what did Abram do? How did, what does this mean for us? We can't gloss over the holiness of God, nor can we gloss over the fact that we, like Abram, fall short of that glory and therefore fall short and, and, and deserve punishment, which is eternal death. Not, not blessing from God, not multiplicate. The, the things that God promises here, in, 
walk blameless before me that I might make my covenant between me and you and multiply you greatly. Well, we fall short, so we don't deserve those things. But God, rich in mercy, comforts Abram with grace in the midst of his inadequacies. Look at what God says. So Abram falls on his face and he's like, oh no, I've blown it and nothing I can do can ever make up for this. I'm toast. I'm hopeless. Look at the beginning of verse 4. Behold, my covenant is with you. It's my covenant. Remember, God, God is going to remain faithful to his covenant with Abram because it's rooted in his character. And then he reassures Abram. He says, you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. And if this reaffirmation wasn't clear enough, then what God does is he changes Abram's name. No longer shall you be called Abram, for your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you, past tense, made you the father of a multitude of nations. So by this name change, God literally is changing Abram's, now Abraham's, identity as a person. That, that, that Hebrew word, Abram, what that means is exalted father, which we can get into all the irony of, of this old man who's 99 years old, still has no kids, and then God says, no longer will you be exalted father, I'm going to change your name to Abraham, which is the exalted father of a multitude, of a multitude. That might seem odd. So remember, he still has no kid. He still doesn't have the promised offspring, but what's fascinating is that God uses the past tense. I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I've already made you this. Like, this promise is as good as done. Your wife yet hasn't even conceived, but it's as good as done. Then God goes on to say, I will make you exceedingly fruitful, which if you really want to get into breaking that down, what the Hebrew is actually saying is, God says, I will cause you to multiply with muchness, muchness. Like, in case you don't get it enough, I'm going to not add to your number, I'm going to multiply your number greatly and greatly and greatly. So not only is God showing how expansive Abram's offspring will be, but, but he says, I'm going to bring this about. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I have made you the father of many nations. I will do these things. I will cause you to multiply. I will bring this about. Not you. Remember, this is God, the giver of life who spoke the earth into existence, where nothing was in six days by his word he spoke, and all the life that we see was here. It's the same God. And to show how great this covenant would be, God says, not only will nations come from you, but the kings who rule those nations, they'll come from you too. Verse 6. The kings will come from you too. Oh, and verse 7 and 8, in case you didn't miss it, this is an everlasting covenant. This isn't just something I'm making with you and maybe your son and then it will die off. No, it will be forever. Nations will come from you forever. You will be blessed forever. Kings will come from you forever. You'll dwell in a promised land forever. There is an ongoing forever eternal aspect to this covenant. And then we know that through the covenant that God makes with, with David, who is Abram's descendant down the line, that there is going to be a forever king who sits on the throne and rules all of these nations forever. Jesus. Where all of these nations that came from Abram will dwell forever with this forever king in this forever promised land. I'm getting ahead of myself. But... Look at the last five words of verse 8. I will be their God. <clears throat> I will be their God. I hinted at this last week, but this is really important. This is God promising to give himself to these people who didn't deserve it. This is a promise of Emmanuel, which means God with us, who will come to his people and literally give himself up, give his life up for these very people who broke this very covenant. Now, I'm for sure getting ahead of myself, so let me just dial back in. 
but, but, but I, I, you have to see this, all right? When you look at this first paragraph and you see the grace of God here, you have to see Abram deserves none of this. He's ruined his chance before, and if you keep reading in Genesis, he's going to ruin his chance again. He deserves none of this. And at the moment where he is overwhelmed with his unworthiness, like, like John or Jeremiah before the throne of God, and he's just overwhelmed with his sin in the face of God's glory, and he falls flat on his face, God responds with grace and meets him there. And he promises one of the most amazing covenants to him. And this is what we see at the turn in, in verse 9. Then God turns to Abraham. Then God turns to Abraham. He says, as for you. And this is where we see Abram's act. Abraham's act, verses 9 to 14. So just so you know, verse 1 through 8 is kind of God's end of the covenant. Verses 9 through 14 is Abraham's end of the covenant. Now, I'll get into the specifics of the covenant in a minute, but the gist of it is this. Abraham and his men were to be circumcised. Now, if you don't know what circumcision is, it's the removal of foreskin from a male's reproductive organ, okay? And so, in that culture, outside of a few priests in Egypt at the time, it wasn't a very common practice. It wasn't a super common. It was for the priests in Egypt, but it wasn't really a common practice of the day. And so, when, when God commands this, on one side of the coin, he's saying, I want you to be set apart and different from everyone else. But since they knew what circumcision was because of the priests, if you read forward ahead into Exodus, I think Exodus 19, they're called a kingdom of priests. But we'll get there. Now, we know what that is, okay? We know what circumcision is. And so I'm sure you go, yeah, but why that sign specifically? Why that act? Again, Noah got a rainbow. Did this cut out? Are we good? Does this keep cutting out or in? If it does, I'll just grab that. Um, so Noah got a rainbow, and God could have given Abram anything else, especially, especially at the age of 99, especially at the age of 99. I mean, and, and I'm thinking too, he's holding on to this promise that God gave him of a seed, and if this procedure went wrong, I don't, I mean, I'm sure he's wondering, like, is this promise ever going to come true? I mean, the, the promise of that seed now is at risk. And then I'm like, wait a minute, maybe that's the point. Maybe that's why God gave this sign. Maybe God was telling Abram that he had to trust God with the very member through which this covenant promise would be realized. The very body part through which this seed would come, God says, hey, trust me with that. Trust me with that. I mean, remember, this, this was a wild promise that God made when Abram was 75. Now he's 99. 24 years Later, still no seed, and then God says, okay, now go do this. I mean, talk about faith, right? To trust the Lord with that. But, but that's where we see Abraham's faith. And, and, and I think what's fascinating about this is it seems like a counterintuitive act, but, but he took God at his word and obeyed the word of God. And before I move on, I, I want to just, I, I think this is where we can find some very pointed yet pertinent yet tough application for us today. Because I think many times a lot of us are, are brought into a situation where need, we need to trust God and obey Him when it doesn't necessarily make sense, when it might seem counterintuitive. I mean, it seems that Abraham learned his lesson from 12 years ago with Hagar, and this time we see he's going to stay faithful to Sarai He's going to stay faithful and trust God to keep his word, even in the most improbable circumstances. And so I'm sitting here, at, at this point in my study, I'm like, I just want to pause real quick. Do I have that same faith? Do I follow God's word in the same way that that might even mean I might lose something of value to me? I might lose something that might seem counterintuitive. I, these friends might reject me, and I might have 
certain things from my life be ripped away? Do I still follow God's Word? Do I still follow God's Word if it costs us a long-weighted promotion that I've been working my whole career for? Do we still follow God's Word, even if it doesn't give us the financial security or, I don't, I don't know, whatever it is for you, do you still follow God's Word knowing what He said, knowing what's right, and then we have these external pressures going, that might not make sense. Do you still follow God's Word? I mean, do we look, like Jesus said, at the birds of the air and the lilies of the field who neither reap nor sow and say, well, if our Heavenly Father provides for them, how much more will He care for His kids, His children? us? Or do we, when faced with doubt, pull a Sarah and her plan with Hagar and say, you know what? I'm going to bring about his promises under my control. So I I guess the heart of the question of what I'm asking with all these applications is, is this, do we take God at his word? Do you take God at his word? Do you take God at his word? Because Abraham did. Remember, chapter 15, verse 6. That's like Abraham's life verse. It's his mantra. Abraham believed, and it was counted to him as righteousness. He believed. He believed. And despite his failings, God is faithful to him because of his belief. Like, do we know that faithfulness of God? Do we believe? Do we trust in? Does our life reflect the reality that God is faithful to who He is and He's going to do what He says He's going to do? Does our life reflect that reality? I'm, again, I am not pointing fingers at any of you. This is just for me in my personal time in the Word this week. That's what's going through my head as I'm digging into this passage. I'm sitting there and I'm like, does my life reflect just unthinkable trust in God when it doesn't make sense? Because obviously I trust God when it makes sense. I'm a logical person. But when it doesn't make sense, or might actually cost me something, do I still trust Him? My my hope and prayer for us is that that we wouldn't trust in ourselves, our own plans, or, or pretend to come to God going, but have you thought about it from this way? And like we, you know, submit our plans to God and go, maybe you can just try this instead but that we would rather trust in him to be faithful to his word. All right, back to Genesis. Before we get into the significance of circumcision, I want to just point out two quick observations of this covenant. Because I I think we've seen, number one, that to to answer the question, why circumcision? Number one, it's because Abraham had to trust God with the very member through which the promise would come. And I think we see two other reasons. The second one is this. Look at verse 12. He who is eight days old among you. So who needs to be circumcised? Both those in Abram's house, he who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male through your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who's not your offspring. So both those who are Abram's, as people in the South say, his kin, right? but also those who came in either who were slaves or servants or maybe even adopted people in his house who aren't necessarily blood to him. Now, not only is this where we see the curse of Babel starting to be reversed and turned as Abraham is going to be the blessing of many nations, right? The foreigners who were brought into his house, but we see something that's not just a New Testament concept, from the start of the very thing that signified Jew from Gentile, from the inception of that covenant here in the text, we see that salvation and covenant is not only for Jews, but also for Gentiles. This is not something that like Jesus and Paul dreamt up at the time of Christ. This is something that goes back centuries before, all the way back to Abraham. So, Number one, why circumcision? Because, because of the trust that it caused. Number, number two, I think we see that, that there is, um, there is a, 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 a blessing and a redemptive promise of, of cleansing of people from all tribes, all tongues, all nations. And number three, 
the eighth day. He was eight days among you. Put a pin in that. I'm going to come back to it. But I want to look at one last thing before we kind of summarize all this. Look at verse 13 and 14. For God's covenant keepers, for God's covenant keepers, he promises an everlasting covenant. Verse 13. But for those who don't keep the covenant, he promises that they will be cut off. In other words, there is both a blessing and a curse here at play, like most covenants. For those who are in the covenant, they are to cut off their foreskins. For those who are not in the covenant, who do not cut off their foreskins, they will be cut off from God and his people. This is an intentional use of language, that phrase, cut off. Remember back in Genesis 15, when God cuts the covenant with Abraham, what does he do? He cuts animals in half and passes through them. It's the cutting of the covenant. He's saying, if I break this covenant, let me be like this. So here, in chapter 17, by making the sign of a covenant, cutting off, what circumcision is doing is is pointing to covenant breakers being cut off in judgment. So not only is there a blessing, there's also a curse. And this is an important act, then, that men and their families enter into and, and should not take it lightly. But the reason it's so important is because it puts an immense level of pressure now on people who enter this covenant. Because so far, this covenant with Abraham, or Abram, now Abraham, has been very one-sided. It's just been God being like, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this. You messed up, I'm going to keep doing this, I'm going to keep doing this, I'm gonna, it's who I am, that won't change. Here, for the first time, we see humans have their end of the bargain that they need to uphold. But wait a minute. Verse 3, Abram fell on his face. He realized he can't do this. I can't do this. You can't do this. None of us could do this. And I think that's where then we need to start tracing this covenant throughout the Bible where we'll see circumcision's significance. Circumcision's significance. So there are two specifics of circumcision that point us beyond the text. Obviously, the, the tr- I'd say three. So trust. The number two is that it had to take place on the eighth day. We see that in verse 12. Now, the eighth day. Okay, what's significant? Now, don't think of me as some crazy numerology guy that gets into all the numbers of the Bible. We can have that discussion, but I'm, just, I'm trying to read this as what the author intended it. Okay? So if you remember back to Genesis chapter 1, how many days did God create the world and rest? Seven. Seven. Seven days. And so then, by putting it on the eighth day, there is this hint, this hint of pointing towards a new creation, or what the, the biblical or theological term for it is redemption. There's a hint here, even in, on it being on the eighth day of a kid's life, this pointing towards redemption. Okay, so number one, trust. Number two, redemption. And number three, this is another reason as to why circumcision is so significant. There obviously is a health benefit at play. That's why a lot of people today with modern medicine, we practice circumcision still, even though we're not Jewish. Now, if, if I mean, you can Google or whatever, research, I don't know. Um, but there, there are health benefits that decrease a lot of risks in circumcision because it's just, it's more hygienic. In simpler terms, it's a cleansing act. It's a cleansing act. And and this is significant because back in Genesis chapter 3, procreation was defiled by sin. And so this cleansing act was a sign on the very member that otherwise would produce only a sinful offspring without God's sovereign grace intervening. Now, what does this mean? What this means is, yes, this was an outward act. It was an outward act, but it was always to point to something deeper and something better. I mean, we know you can read, I mean, if you do a biblical search on the word circumcision and read all that Paul has to say about it, the act itself doesn't save you. Just like if you come up here one Sunday and you get baptized, that, that act itself does not save you. It symbolizes something, it points to something, but the act itself doesn't 
save you. It was an act, it's an act of faith, not an act to faith. It's an act of faith in response to faith. It, it was from faith that a man and his family were to be circumcised. Remember, Genesis 15 comes before Genesis 17. It's important, okay? Abram is 99 years old. And if he was not sold on God's faithfulness to keep his word, there's no way he would have done this. He had faith in who God is. And because he responded with faith, he now had a reminder of God's covenant. And now every single time a Jewish man ever had to use the restroom, they too were reminded of God's faithfulness to his covenant. Not only that God would be faithful to them, but but their physical circumcision pointed to something deeper. It pointed to something deeper, circumcision of the heart. Now, you might think, okay, Michael, you're trying to draw a bunch of strings where this isn't there. Assuming that Moses wrote the book of Genesis, he he wrote what what we call the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible. He wrote most of it. It includes his death. Obviously, he didn't write about his death, what happened afterwards. But he wrote most of it, okay? And in the book of Deuteronomy, he gives this grand sermon kind of summarizing the law and its significance to the people of Israel while they're wandering around in the desert. In Deuteronomy 10, 16, he gets to circumcision and he says this, circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and no longer be stubborn. What he's doing is he's drawing out deeper theological themes that circumcision was intended to communicate to them, and I think also to us. Our our hearts need to be cut by the Word of God. Our, our, Our hearts are to be set apart like the Jewish people of the day from the Gentiles. Our hearts are to be set apart for God's glory. Our hearts must be cleansed, reflecting God's purity. So Moses says, don't just circumcise your flesh. Let God's Word cut you deep in the heart. Circumcise your heart lest you be cut off from him and his people. Well, if you know the story of Israel and what happens next, you'll know that even though all of the men were circumcised in the flesh on the eighth day, their hearts weren't circumcised. They disobeyed God. They, they had hardened hearts that the word, they wouldn't let the word of God cut through. And so what happened? They were cut off in exile. They were overtaken by either the Assyrians or the Babylonians, depending on what what nation they were in, and they were cut off in judgment. But even in the midst of their judgment, even when the people are in exile, God sends prophet after prophet after prophet to promise to them there is a new creation coming. There is deliverance. There is redemption. There is this promise. I'm going to uphold what I said I would do from the beginning of this book. I'm going to stay good to my word. And ultimately, all of this would point forward to Jesus, who who comes and brings the new covenant, the final covenant, the ultimate covenant. And this is the beauty of God's covenant, right? Abraham could not keep the covenant. No one in Israel could keep the covenant. And if you and I tried, we too could not keep the covenant because none of us, as Robert said earlier, none of us have pure hearts. None of us have pure, circumcised hearts, And so what did God do? He didn't just say, well, good luck. No, he he took it upon himself. Remember, I will be their God. I'm going to give myself to you. I'm going to take it upon myself to act on your behalf. I'm going to send Jesus to the world to keep the law in your place, thereby meriting every single benefit of all the covenants of Scripture. Jesus deserved every single benefit, every blessing, every multiplication, all the stuff in Scripture that God promises to those who are faithful. Jesus warranted that through his perfect life. I'm going to get to his death, but we can't skip over his perfect life. Jesus merited every blessing of every covenant, and then what he did when he went to the cross was he suffered the curse of circumcision. What does that mean? You remember what he cried out on the cross? My God, my my covenant God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you cut me off? Why have you sent me away in judgment? Friends, when, when Jesus faced God's wrath for our sin, he was cut off from the Father for us in our stead. In order to secure the covenant blessings which he earned 
from the covenant of circumcision. At the cross of Jesus Christ, that's where the new covenant was cut. That's where the blood, the perfect blood of our Savior was poured out for us. And the reason that despite our disobedience, like Abram, despite our disobedience, that every single covenant promise and spirit-wrought blessing is ours in Christ is because he bore our curse for breaking the covenant. And he did that on the cross. So what happens then is when we repent of our sins and believe in him, well then we're united to him. The union with Christ is so important for all of us to understand. We're united to him. What, what that means is that when, when he died, so too we died. When he was judged for our sin, our, our sins were judged. They're dealt with. They don't need to be paid for again. They don't need to be dealt with again. He paid for them fully and finally at the cross. And now, because of our faith in him, we can stand before God redeemed justified, forgiven, and set apart for his glory. Not by circumcision of the flesh. No, but, but by circumcision of the heart. And if you read the passages of the New Testament that talk about circumcision of the heart, what that is is when the Spirit pierces your heart and regenerates you and makes you alive in Christ, gives you faith that says, yes, I know that Jesus lived for me, died for me, and rose for me, and I am now going to be with him forever. That's what union with Christ, that's what circumcision of the heart does in us. Friends, this is the hope of circumcision. This is why it's so important. I know it's a painful act. I know it's uncomfortable to talk about. I sent a message out this week. Parents, get ready. We're going to have some fun conversations. I'm sure some of you were like, thanks for the heads up. Um, I understand it's awkward and weird to talk about but we have to know that, that, that this was not just something that God goes, oh, well, they're doing it over there. Let's just, let's try that here. No, this is an intentional act of God, an intentional act of God to be a sign for his people, not only to secure through Abram a, a seed, but also to point us towards Abram's ultimate seed, Jesus, and show God's faithfulness through Christ, who was cut off for us by facing God's wrath so that we would never be cut off from God. Rather, we would enjoy all the blessings and all the promises of this everlasting covenant with our everlasting King in an everlasting land forever and ever. Amen. Let me pray for us this morning.